so I just want to welcome you all to, I believe it's, yes, yeah, the 15th Annual Media Studies Showcase. My name is Louis Grosso. I'm the Program Director of the Media Studies Program. And I'm really, really very happy to be here with you in person, finally, this year. Yeah, let's give it a little lively. Yeah. The last couple of years, we were doing the showcase virtually. We were emailing a, a video that we prepared to students. And, you know, it was good. We got through it. But there's nothing better than being in person. Uh, the thing is, I know you're in the program. You might not be in the program. But if you're in the program, there are three concentrations. You might be in film studies, and you don't know what's going on in radio and television production. You might be in television production, and you don't know what's going on in journalism, and vice versa. And here's the opportunity to find out what's going on in the programs, OK? Because in the program, you, you, your concentration is, is, is one area, which you're allowed to take at least 12 credits, and a secondary concentration. So if you're journalism, you can take 12 credits in radio and television production. If you're film studies, you can take 12 credits in journalism, and vice versa. Uh, before I go any further, I just want to acknowledge we have a few very special guests. Uh, our, our, our provost and vice president is Dr. Eva Fernandez, is right here. Give a wave. Thank you. Our associate provost, Dr. Dina Whipple, is back there. Give a wave. That's pretty cool. I mean, they come, they come and check out what's going on in media studies. I mean, it's, it's really very, a very good thing. I'm very honored to have them here, and I hope we do good by them. Uh, last but not least, we have our opening remarks from our Dean of the School of Liberal Arts, Dr. Peter West. So give a warm media studies welcome to Dr. Peter West. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to very quickly say hi. Um, I've been here at Mercy for two and a half years. And as Professor Grasso says, it's been a few years since we've actually done this in person. So I've only seen this virtually. I've been looking forward to this. One of the awesome things about media studies and all the programs over in communication and the arts are all the different kinds of skills and experiences that you all have. So we always tell students that even though we try to brag about our programs and our facilities, it's only when we see what you do with our faculty and all these facilities that we actually recognize what makes the school such a special place. So I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much to all of you and to all the faculty and the administrators who are here. And I'm looking forward to seeing what we have today. So thank you, Professor Brown. So thanks, everybody. Okay, so on with the program. Up next is our, our, our department chair, actually, Professor Michael Prada. He also is the teacher of the journalism courses at Mercer College, and he also is the faculty advisor to the award-winning news publication, The Impact, theimpactnews.com. So please welcome Professor Michael Parada. And the student of the Thank you. So this is Malik Monroe. He is a senior? Junior. 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 Um, his levels are so advanced, I thought he was a senior. <laughs> but he is a junior in the Media Studies program. He is also the current managing editor to our college newspaper, The Impact. So thank you for joining us up here, Malik. On his absolute insistence, he wanted me to print out an article that he had written so everyone can read. <laughs> and he demanded that the only way he would come up there is Vanity gets to be printed out. So thank you. So today we are going to quickly talk about uh, one of the stories that Monique did last February. And those of you from the Bronx may have been familiar with this tragedy that occurred in February about a massive fire in the Bronx that. Um, unfortunately led to casualties, um, yet fortunately there was a Mercy College alumni, actually a former athlete at the school too, he was on the soccer team, who lived in the building and actually saved somebody's life, a child, he went back in and carried a child out. So what does this mean for us on the news side? What does this mean for us as a journalist? Well, typically, we are used to, when we say news reporting, we're saying just the facts. You know, what you may f be familiar with, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. This is where we do not effectively tell a story with emotion. 
This is not where we effectively tell story with opinion, with um, any type of anything other than, I guess, as they used to say on Dragnet, just the fact. But from a news perspective, when you're a reporter, your end goal is to be the best reporter in the room. And that means when there are opportunities to separate your story from other stories, you have to take advantage of that. So this is a story where we kind of look for the name of this kind of quick presentation, weaving feature writing into news reporting. So right away, there were a couple elements that we looked for. And the first was something that we talk about in class all the time called localization. Localization. The first thing that people always, you know, are we interested in a news story is just the most basic element, human interest. You know, are people even going to be interested in the topic we're discussing? And that's a pretty, pretty basic one. Second is the concept of localization. Is there anything local that would appeal to my readership? Because I have to separate my story from everyone else's story because I want that better placement. I want people to read my story. I want people to know about my story. So we had one, the Bronx, which is a campus of Mercy College, and that a lot of people from this school go to. But second, we had an alumni involved in this situation. Now, right away, that brought us to this is a story we can really hone on and focus on because one of our own is involved in this story. In attempting not to lose our audience with the basic facts of who, what, when, where, why, and how, we're going to do what we call a feature lead, and that's what's something we talk about in feature article one and feature article two. That's using emotion, that's using description, that's making you feel like you're in the scene instead of just giving you statistics and facts. That also means we're going to separate the word count. Kind of what's going on right now, and I'm sure some of you who read stuff online, you see word counts are smaller in stores. 400 words, 500 words, just quick little blurbs and hits, because that's the way you take your content now. You're on your phone, you're walking to the bus, you're in the subway. But when you get a situation like this, we need to be able to write that 1,000-word story. We want to keep your interest. We don't want to just gloss, gloss all over the really good story. So right away, Malik and I saw that this was an opportunity to do a really good story. Malik, so you had, oh, you know what, let's uh, just scroll down for a little bit, and we'll just read the first couple seconds. Uh, Muhammad Kata, a co Mercy College alumni who graduated in 2019, doesn't see himself as a hero, even though everyone around him does. The night of January 9th is when Kaida earned his new role. He was awakened by the cry of a fire alarm. Kaida says that his particular sound was reoccurring annoyance in his 19-story Bronx apartment building. Come on, he told himself, it's too late for this, not again. He went on to explain that since the first fire alarm goes off so many times, most residents simply ignore it. Nobody really takes it seriously. Unfortunately, this decision turned out to be a near fatal mistake. So what are we doing there? We're getting your interest. We're making you realize something bad happened. There's danger. And essentially, readership appeals to that. Malik, when we first came across this story and we knew we had to reach out to uh, Muhammad, how did that go for you? Well, he didn't really want to do this interview. Uh, I had to get him kind of comfortable with me, because like I said, the opening thing, he doesn't want to see people, he doesn't want people to see him as a hero. Uh, so I had to get him comfortable, had to get him talking. And then, yeah, so I mostly just DM'd him. Okay. For like the first day or two, and then I got him on the phone, and then the full interview. So here's the interesting thing in news reporting. When someone does something really bad, they don't want to talk to you. And when somebody does something really good, they don't want to talk to you. Um, they're really modest and say, oh, no, not me, please. You know, I don't want to make a big thing of it. Um, so what do we do for modern techniques? And I'm talking modern even, you know, you know if I go back to college 20-something years ago, DM someone? No, never. The, well, that's modern reporting. Um, instead, I would probably knock on your door or call repeatedly or send an email. Um, and now we're using social media. We're using the, the um, advantages of technology to get attention. So once he became comfortable with you and you kind of convinced him into doing the interview, how did, how did it go? It was good. He was still a bit hesitant. So I had to go, like, it wasn't just one interview, it was over a few days. Mm -hmm. But 
that was still good. Also, another good thing, like you said, social media. I think that's a really good tool for modern journalists. Because mm -hmm. near the end of this story, I used a lot of Instagram posts about the family that he helped save. So that was another good thing that I used. So modern technology, um, using and finding sources. And this is something where, you know, if anyone had ever seen an old uh, movie, um, All the President's <coughs> Men, where one of the reporters has to find a source, he literally pulls out a phone book and starts calling random people from every state. Are you this person? Are you this person? Are you this person? And now you can type somebody's name in and say, oh, they have an Instagram account. They have a Facebook account. So you can use all these skills that a majority of you use all the time anyway and actually use it professionally to help find sources. So we followed up, and we got the New York City Mayor Eric Adams, um, FDNY Commissioner Daniel Negro. How hard was it to get these sources, Malik? Well, they were very hard, so that's why I used their uh, official Instagram posts and Twitter posts to get those quotes. So when something happens, you know, usually you, you'll call your police chief, you'll call your fire department, usually there's someone on staff um, who is able to give you the information. But when it, this was a national story. So all of a sudden, reporters from all over New York, all over uh, the East Coast, were trying to get these people. And all of a sudden, I don't have time for you. I don't have 15 minutes. Um, the bigger the story, sometimes the less accessible a source is to get. So Malik was very resourceful um, finding their Twitter accounts and, and whatnot. Let's talk about uh, another element of feature writing briefly before we move on to the description. So, if you could just scroll down, Malik, why did you think it was so important to break down the scene of what he encountered? I got up and rushed in the kitchen to see if anything was coming from my apartment. Then I opened up my doorway and there was so much smoke I couldn't see anything. Um, so you're kind of actually telling the tale um, of what happened. He took a fall, he hurt his leg. Why is it so important for a reader to be put into the story in a matter like this. Okay. Well, originally I wrote it as just a basic news story. Then I kept on rereading it, it was really boring. Like it was nothing very personal about it. And when I was talking to him, he was very passionate about what he was saying. So I thought I would kind of go against the grain of what the impact does and kind of make it a feature, make it more of a narrative. So when anyone reading this, it would be like they're doing it with them. It would make it more personal. Sure. And that's one of the tricks we use um, when we're storytelling in the news is make the person feel that they are part of the story. Let them see it. Let them feel it. We wanted them to, cho to choke on the smoke. We wanted them to feel how heavy carrying people out was, the pain he had in his leg from falling. When you're invested in a story like that, you'll continue reading, and you'll share it, and you'll talk about it. Uh, if you could scroll down just a little bit. So he met a family. He saved a child. And now they have a relationship. Talk about that real briefly and how you talked about that in the story. Okay, well, when I was on the phone with him, he didn't want to talk about them much. So a few days after, I saw him post it on his Instagram story about how he met the mom and the daughter again, and he got to reunite with them. So instead of keep on bashing about like talking about it more, I'll just use his Instagram posts okay. to get that information. So you scroll there. So then it comes to uh, wrapping up. You can scroll down to the, to the bottom. Um, so good quotes are part of a good feature story. He definitely built a bond that will never be broken. So that's something you see that. And as a reporter and as a storyteller, you're like, ah, oh, I got to have that quote. I got to throw that in there. Um, after the fire, with so many stories about pains and loss, many have started seeking Muhammad Qaeda as a hero, uh, but he doesn't feel comfortable with that status. I keep telling everyone I don't consider myself a hero. I feel like God put me at the right place at the right time to help someone else. I just happen to be there and be able to help them, so I just went for it. So if you knew any, know anything about news reporting, this is exactly what we don't want to do at the end of your standard news story. You know, when you write in the inverted pyramid, we're going to go most important information to least important information, and the story just goes until it runs out but not this type of story. 
not a story that you start with a feature lead, not a story that people are already emotionally invested in. When you start with an anecdotal lead or a scene lead, you have to end with something strong and emotional as well. So how about your just decision of how to end this? Okay, well, this is a thing in feature writing called a circle kicker. Basically, we start with an idea or topic and then end it with that same topic. So instead of kind of half-assing it and kind of just starting it with this really powerful quote, I would end it with another really powerful quote going back to the beginning of uh, this article. Are there any questions? So this kind of story was, you know, combining elements that we learned in News Reporting 1 and that we learned in Feature Article 1 and Feature Article 2 and then putting them actually into practice in Media 333, which is a uh, news publication. So everything is about taking what we learn in the classes and then putting it into our practicum, and that's why we have an award-winning college newspaper due to students like me. Are there any questions? Thank you, Malik. Thank you, everyone. So, you know, I teach television production. It's the reason why I'm here. It's the reason why I wanted to be here. Uh, when you're up in Victory Hall 205, there's a glass doors, and there's a set of glass doors behind those glass doors, and they're always closed, and the curtain, you don't know what goes on in there. Well, there's a television production studio in there. There's also radio production studios in there as well. And those of you that have been in the class, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but television, there's really eight levels of television. There's three levels of studio production, and there's another four levels of, of uh, field production, and then there's video editing in, in addition to that. What I'm going to show you real quick is uh, from last semester's uh, television field production class, television field production class, which were working outside of the studio. Uh, students write and produce their own scenes. A lot of students like to write humor, so we go along with it. Uh, but they, uh, they use all the skills they've learned in TV1, TV2, and TV3, how to slate, how to edit, how to do all those things. And this was two parts of an assignment that we ended up putting it together. Justin Abraham is sitting right here. Get up, John. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. And I decided, stand on there, I decided to put his clips from the part one and part two together because they make a nice little story. So, you want to say anything about it before we go? Oh, uh, sure. So this. Pause, pause. Pause. So the Soup Man is basically an inside joke in my friend group. Over a few years back, um, I was obsessed with soup. And uh, I invited a character, basically. Three in the morning, I would make a soup, and my friends made fun of me for it. And then over time, they just kept calling me the soup man. Oh, you're gonna go get soup in the morning, this and that. And I decided, you know what, since I'm in video production, and I, you know, I dabble not too much in live action, I do a lot of my storytelling in video games, but live action is something I wanna get into heavily. And I thought, why not make a video on the soup man? So this is it right here. Yeah, roll, it's only three minutes, yeah, roll. Hungry today. Where'd you get that soup from? You're not getting the soup from me. That soup, it belongs to me. Ah, uh, don't, don't, don't step. I'll open this. I swear, don't make me do it. No, 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 my friend. This is not how this works. That is my soup, and I'm going to get that back at no matter what cost. You understand me? I will do whatever it takes to get that soup back. I don't care. <laughs>
I know. Yes, I'm very well aware. Why, you wanna, what, you want soup? You want an order? I can give you the recipe. No, it's fine, no, it's okay. It's okay, I can send you the recipe, it's fine. All right, <laughs> I'll see you. How you were here. I don't know why, but I won that soup. Fair and square, okay? It's mine! Right? Yes. You know how to work out all the moves. Yes. But tell me how long, I mean, shot selection, you had a third person holding the camera. Yeah. You had to explain to that person where you wanted the camera and yeah. how many rehearsals you had gone through mm -hmm. for each shot. Explain that a little bit. So, my friends are not really, you know, film savvy. They're not really familiar with how camera angles work or how to shoot the scene. So I had to walk through exactly how the shots are going to be done. Um, I normally storyboard my stuff. Um, and then I, I show them. But what's also funny about that part too, um, during the production of filming that, I had actually damaged my camera lens. And I don't normally shoot on a phone, I always shoot with, with professional film cameras. And at that time, I accidentally dropped my camera and I damaged my lens and I had to switch quickly to my phone, which I normally use as a backup. But That was actually part of the assignment. Students were required or, or, or use an option for them to use their own phone because uh, you know in, in the field now what they're doing is they're using professional cameras but also they're using their cell phones and they're recording video and sending it up through the cloud and then the, either newsroom or somewhere else would grab it down from the cloud and the editor will get a hold of it and put it together so the field production classes are doing both things they're doing editing with 4k cameras like the one over there on the stand but also they're shooting with their own cell phone but just the slots the, the shot selection I thought was pretty extraordinary I thought, you know, you can very easily lose the narrative. 
if, if the camera's in the wrong place. But in this case, the camera was in the right place all the time. Also, the heavily, the heavy Sergio Leone director's influence, you know, Good to Bad, the Ugly soundtrack, you hear that going on, the character with the, the sombrero. I, I, thought, I thought it was really very good. All right, thanks, thanks, yes, Jesse. Thank Up next is, uh, <laughs> Joe, this is Where's My Sandwich? This is from the same class, which was completely shot with her cell phone and edited with her cell phone. It's much shorter. Joe Kathy's actually working in the field right now. I told her about it. She couldn't make it, but she is working, doing production, so I'm very happy for her. So roll, uh, just roll this one real quick. It's about three minutes long. Last little sandwich, little sandwich here. Dude, where's my sandwich? Dude, where's my sandwich? I don't know, man. Are you sure about that? Cause I just came back to the kitchen and the sandwich is gone, bro. Yeah, I'm sure, bro. I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't seen it. So what's that behind you then? Excuse me, cameraman. Okay, so they're really kidding around there. But again, the shot selection, the framing of the shots, uh, even without the dialogue, without the audio, you could still follow the story because the visuals are very, very obvious. I mean, that's when you're telling the story, you want to tell it more than one level, both with the audio, but also with the visuals. And that's field production. The well, last one I'm going to move on to is uh, studio production. Jenny, you want to come up a little bit? Because sure. Jenny's here. Uh, this is Television, uh, Television 3 in the studio. This is not edited. This is not edited at all. This is, uh, the narrative is put together. It's like, it's like theater only covered with the cameras. Okay. Uh, uh, you want to say something about, about my films? <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, so this, uh, this was a project I did for TV3 in the studio, and it was inspired by an actual interaction I had with my uncle uh, over the summer last year. We were at a restaurant, and he couldn't find his pills that he thought he brought into the restaurant with him. Emma, things might have gotten a little hectic last time we went out, but I'm cool treating you guys to a nice dinner. I would have preferred Breezy's Burgers, but this place will do. Oh, shut it. That's all you ever eat. This place has authentic Italian food. I can make my own Italian food at home. You call that Italian food? Well, I can guarantee you're going to love the food here. They have chicken alfredo. They got penne alla vodka. Oh, do they have tacos? No, this is an Italian restaurant. 
What are the words on this menu? I can't read a thing. Adrian, please, no games at the table. Ooh, they have pizza. Honey, put that away. You're being disrespectful. What? Eat. Wait, where are my pills? Ooh, I think I'm gonna get the chicken parmesan. This is fine. I swear I brought them into the restaurant with me. I'm sure you left them in the car, Uncle Brian. No, I swear I brought them into the restaurant with me. Did you figure out which one to eat, sweetie? Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna get anything. What? Is everyone ready to order? No. Did they get swept up? Don't look in the garbage. Can you just check the car, sweetie? Fine, I'll check the car. Yes, I won. Honey, put that down. Order your food. But mom. Are you sure you're not hungry again? I think I'm just gonna get the spaghetti. They were in the car. Uh, you know what? Here is two hundred dollars. I'm going to the spa next door. Are any of you ready to order now? <laughs> the rehearsals and the recordings and the time it takes to do something like that. Yeah, it took a while because I was in, I was behind the camera in the booth on the side. So I, like, uh, in like a headset, I was telling the camera operators to like, you know, okay, pan left or pan right, and uh, it took a few tries to get it right because it's really hard, especially with that specific scene. Uh, I had a lot of camera angles in mind, so I had to really work hard to get the precise like directions out. Uh, but yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. It's just directing, directing live multi camera. That's that's what that is. Thank you, thank you. All right. All right. Up next, uh, Professor, well, now she's Professor Edie Magnus. She's going to wear that hat today. Professor Edie Magnus teaches television performance and interviewing techniques with today's media. Please welcome Professor Edie Magnus. Hi, I have my camera on for a moment, but it will all make sense. So I had two. Courses, so I hope you'll forgive me that I have some notes on this. Um, so one of them is interviewing techniques for today's media, and one is performance techniques for today's media, and I'm going to show you a clip of both of those in a minute. So the interviewing techniques, we take a big interview, and by the way, I see lots of students here, past and present, very happy to see you all. Um, we take a big interview, and we kind of divide the process into its component parts of before, during, and after. So before an interview, we talk about research and sourcing and how you evaluate what you're, the information you're getting about someone you're interested to interview. And we develop questions and talk about why you wrote those questions and what other questions you might have written that could have elicited um, some interesting information. And we talk about, um, um, we just review all the different places that um, an interview, a feature story from an interview might be written. So if it's something for Money Magazine, it's gonna be different than for Vogue Magazine. And how does John Oliver do an interview versus how does 60 Minutes do an interview? Um, so we, we talk about all of the things that happen sort of in the setup, in the preamble, in, and, and some of the mechanics too, like calling, identifying yourself, many of the things that, at, that Mike talked about. Then there is during the interview, which is, um, and we talk a lot about active listening during an interview. and doing the right follow-ups and being present, which is actually, it's sort of a quality that I think has legs in um, our students' lives in lots of ways, just being present when they, when they are, uh, are hearing information, asking tough questions, learning to listen for the big, the, the nuggets of a story that you want. Do you know if you have that quote if you're writing it for print? Do you know if you have that sound bite if you're writing it for um, television or radio? 
Um, and we do work in the studio too, which you're going to see. Um, one of my favorite things is um, to have the students uh, go home and read this quote. This is an old, old quote by um, a journalist named Janet Malcolm, who writes, Every journalist who is not too stupid or full of himself to notice what is going on knows that what he does is morally indefensible. He is a kind of confidence man, preying on people's vanity, ignorance, or loneliness, gaining their trust, and betraying them without remorse. So we talk a lot about what that means, what the interaction between an interviewer and an interviewee is, and what they think about the notion of how they portray people without remorse when they do stories about them. And then after we talk about finding a focus, you, so you have all the information from an interview you get, the first part of the um, course is um, someone that you might like to interview, and then the second part of the course you actually bring someone in who you are interviewing, and we talk about spinning those interviews out across platforms. So how do you tell that same story, starting with an interview, how do you find a focus for it, and then tell that story for print, for radio, for the web, there are different competing aesthetics and all of those things. So you tell, how do you tell that same story, but for different media? So that's interviewing techniques. Um, and that's a very fast summation of that. But then, then we do performance techniques, which is everything kind of that Mark doesn't do, which is all the stage stuff. So we start with basic, it's all, it's all about standing and delivering, basically. So we have um, exercises on breathing, on articulation and diction, and Dr. Seuss makes an appearance in this because he's the king of articulation and diction. Um, we do live versus recorded um, performances. So the students tell a story at home to their phones, a, a personal story that they can tell um, without stopping. And then they come into class and they tell that same story to the class. And we talk about what it feels like to tell a story when you just have, when you're just performing to a camera and there's no audience and you have to imagine an audience and what it's like then to tell that story to a live audience, how it feels different, what detail do you include in or out, what's the energy that you're drawing on in one scenario versus another. And we do voiceover work. I have them do commercial voiceover work and public service announcements and news, we're going to be actually going into the studio, please, 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 sure, for the end of uh, the term, oh. and vlogging. And this year, for some reason, I got into my head that I really wanted the students to do monologues and to record something at home which they had memorized. They had to stay with it. They could not move from the camera. They couldn't cheat, couldn't look, um, because the camera never blinks. And um, just what it felt like to go deeper and deeper into a performance to camera. So here's a clip, here's a, um, a big clip that has all of those things that we've done in all those classes. So I hear a lot about the Air Force, but what happens with school? Like currently you're a sophomore here yeah. studying cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, did you receive a call from the Air Force? To um, no, it depends. Uh, as a reservist, you are not bothered a lot more unless there's like something that they got to call you mm -hmm. for. You'll be 20 yes. in a few weeks, right? right? Where do you see yourself overall in 10 years? 10 years, uh, definitely owning my tattoo shop. That, that gives me enough time to, um, to go through the whole apprenticeship process and all the, the business aspects of what owning a tattoo shop is and, and licensing and all that. What's the first song that you released just by yourself? The first song I released by myself, it was on my YouTube channel. It was called How I Roll, and I produced it off of an iPad GarageBand software, and I basically uploaded it to my channel that I had just made.
Hi guys! So today I'm actually going to read I Can Read With My Eyes Shut by Dr. Seuss. I can read in red. I can read in blue. I can read in pickle color too. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not so good street. I would not, could not in a tree, not in a car, you let me be. I do not like them in a box. I do not like them with a fox. I do not like them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Hey there. I bet you want that girl's attention. Maybe you want everybody's attention. Maybe you just want to stand out. Or maybe you want to be that one in the million. You want the lights on you. You want the cameras on you. You want to be the star. But what if I told you, you could be the one in the million with the new Paco brain, one million cologne. Now you can be the star, but guess what? Take it the next step further and smell like the star. What are you waiting for, man? Come on. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nicoletta Ayala reporting live from Yorktown Heights, New York, here to give you your weather outlook for the week. Currently, it's 57 degrees and cloudy. Today's high is going to be 64 with a low of 51. If you were to ask me to describe myself, I would say I'm technically an ambivert, but I tend to still be more on like the quiet introverted side in general. I observe people um, and I'm a thoughtful and meticulous planner. And I'm usually like the peacekeeper and a mediator. You know, I, I think I love her. And well, I know I love her, and before you try and stop me with one of your big brother speeches, just know that this is what I want, all right, for me. And I deserve this, and you have to let me have it, all right? Because you're my brother, and that's what I want, okay? His hair is thin and slicked back, but not in like a tough guy kind of way. In a way where you're just able to see his whole friendly face, you know? And he's charming. He makes me laugh. And not always deliberately. Sometimes he makes me laugh without even trying, you know? And, oh my gosh, he smells good. I think it's this aftershave scent that he's trying out. But, oh, it's just so delicious. The key, though, to faking out the parents is the clammy hands. It's a great non-specific symptom. I'm a big believer in it. I, I know a lot of people will tell you a, a good phony fever is a great deadlock, but a... Uh, you get a nervous mother and you're on your way to the doctors and that's worse than school. And I like working here. I'm family. Aren't we family? That girl is an invader. She's a space invader. <laughs> a, 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 a different kind of species that will swallow us up in here into something, something unrecognizable. Please, Hammer. Please reconsider this idea. Your assumption is correct, Charles. This puts me in an uncomfortable predicament. I don't say one word. Do you love my wife? I do. Does she love you? I believe she does, Charles. Are you both prepared to be together if the path is cleared? I think we can manage. Anyway, there have been times in my life where I have been lucky to let go completely. And I'm flying and flying in such a way where it feels as though something greater than me is carrying me afloat a connection to something higher wider does that sound corny so what i love about all of these things is that we 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 all agree to stand and deliver in these courses and whatever wh whether we're interviewing someone there's a performative aspect to the interviewing obviously and there's all of the performance and um Everybody really does it. Now, Anthony has had the 
I don't know, good fortune, misfortune, depending on how you want to talk about it, to be in both <laughs> of my classes. Correct. Um, and you saw him there in the monologue. But is there anything you want to add about what you've learned from either the, and you did an amazing interview for the interviewing techniques, which I couldn't find or I would have put it in there. Um, and then you did this monologue, for instance. How, how has all of this, what have you gotten out of all of this? Uh, for both classes, I think the best thing I've gotten out of it is there's a certain sense of vulnerability. Uh, for interviewing techniques, to be honest, you have to be able to intake information when someone's at their most vulnerable and publicize it for everyone else to see. And it's a very difficult job, uh, very selfish, but you have to do it. It's something um, you can't stop yourself from doing. And that's Tell them who you interviewed. Uh, I interviewed my brother's dad. Uh, he comes from, uh, we're, I'm from California. Uh, from Los Angeles, he comes from Los Angeles as well. He grew up by himself, uh, he grew up on the street, uh, he grew up surrounded by gang violence, uh, taking part of it as well, uh, former heroin addict. And, but now he, when I was younger, I grew up with my dad, so I um, was raised by him. And there's a certain sense of vulnerability to him uh, that really got to shine in my interview. Unfortunately, it wasn't up here. But that's what it's about, it's about getting to know someone at their deepest and darkest and hardest times, and then showing the world that. Sometimes people don't like it, but it's something you have to do. Performance techniques, uh, there's another sense of vulnerability, but that comes from yourself and being able to let everyone else see it. Uh, you have to, personally, I don't think acting is about being good in front of a camera. I think it's about pretending it's not even there in the first place. Uh, you have to indulge in the character yourself. You have to step out of who you are and be able to take in someone else's work. Thank you. Thank you. And I see lots of others here as well, but any questions? We're good? We're good. Thank you, Professor Mathis. Thank you. You know, there's more food. Don't feel, you know, uncomfortable. Just walk up and grab a sandwich quietly and sit back down while the showcase is going on. As long as you don't disturb anyone up front, it's fine. It's really fine. Uh, up next is Professor John Savage, who teaches radio production one, two, and three. He also teaches video editing, and he also is my technical uh, advisor and, and, and a bunch of technical jobs. He helps me install a bunch of things in the studio. I'm very grateful to have him here with us again today. Please welcome Professor John Savage. Okay. So it's Monday after a long weekend and I'm uh, really in the room yet here. So bear with me a second. You know. At any rate, as Lou said, um, I'm the guy that does radio for, for the school. And um, the thing about our introductory class, it's, it's really to learn how to work in a, in a radio environment. Um, but in order to do that, we have to have some sort of output. And what we do is we do a, um, a couple of PSAs, public service announcements, and commercials. And the students write those. And they perform them, they engineer them, and it's really more about learning to work the equipment and work within the environment. Um, along with learning how to speak, how to not kind of sound like you're just standing there reading dialogue because that gets pretty boring and as you know, you know, that doesn't really work. Um, so what you're about to hear are folks who never sat in a radio lab before, never written scripts, never performed vocally. So are they a little rough? Yes. Are they good? Yeah, considering that this is the first time they've done them. I think they're quite good. So the way the structure works for Radio 1 is you do work with a lab partner of your choosing. And what you come up with is something that will work for both of you. And in the first iteration, which is the, the public service announcements, which are, are done in the can, someone writes it, their lab partner reads or does the announcing while they engineer and produce. For the commercials, they write and read, and their lab partner engineers and essentially produces. So it kind of gets you working with other people and, and trusting other people. So the first 
pair um, of PSAs I want to play are by uh, Victor uh, Manzano and Yadis um, Ramos, and then you'll hear um, both of us. So, yes, thank you. Uh, I'll we'll get. For many New Yorkers, the MTA is the main method of transportation, and we want to let you know some tips to make your commute as smooth and safe as possible. A great tip is to stand away from the platform, with your back against the wall or a pillar. This is to avoid falling or being pushed into the tracks. Another tip is always being aware of your surroundings. The MTA station and bus stops can be unpredictable, so always being alert can save your life and many others. Remember, if you see something, say something. Also, always make sure to check out the MTA app to be caught up on the latest. The MTA app can be found in the App Store or Google Play on your smartphones. Trains and buses can run into some delays, so having the app can save you time and stress. These are only a few tips to help you get to where you're going. Make sure to check out the MTA.info for more information. This PSA was brought to you by the MTA and Ad Council. Listen up, college students. Are you managing your time to the fullest? Did you know there are 24 hours in a day? Eight of them we spend sleeping, leaving us with 16 hours of the day. Here are some simple steps to manage your time better as a college student. Make sure you have your handy dandy planner. Planning out your week will make the days in the week go by smoothly. Step two, set a routine. Take three to four hours every day to get some homework done. Give yourself an extra hour if you have a bad habit of procrastinating. And finally, Step three, the most important step, take an hour or two to yourself. Your mental health matters and you don't want to burn yourself out, whether that is mindlessly scrolling on TikTok or taking the time to meditate. Same different. Remember, managing your time can lead you to better quality work and can lead to achieving your goals. And most importantly, make sure you have free time to go to that next frat party. This message is brought to you by the College App Council. Okay, so they're working on commercials now, and uh, I'll see scripts this week. But um, normally what the progression would be would be to go to Radio 2. And in Radio 2, students create their own radio station. Um, they do everything except, at least up until now, write the music. Um, they pick the format. Everybody has a job to do. Um, which is usually of their own choosing. And um, we spend the entire semester building up to a couple of hours of programming depending on the size of, of the class, which starts and goes through for an hour or two, again, depending on the size of the class, and every element in there outside of the music is student created. Now, I obviously am not going to play a 30-minute or an hour segment for you. Also. We skipped it last semester to do Radio 3. Now, let's we call it Radio 3, but it's radio journalism. Um, and while one of the components is to write a, um, basically a news update for Radio 2, it really is more in the form factor of a two minute update with a one minute um, traffic and weather. So about three minutes of news, and it's a different style. Where it's different from radio, um, from radio journalism is that radio journal journalism is more in the strain of 10-10 uh, wins. So basically 22 minutes, and they give you at least what's going on in their world. Um, they also create all the commercials in that 22 minutes. So basically everyone creates what's essentially a 30-minute news broadcast. Um, and they pull from each other's works. So they have different types of stories they all need to write. And then from that, they can pick and choose and assemble their own 30-minute broadcast. And again, that includes um, the, uh, the commercials. So what I want to play for you is just one example of one type of, 
of news story um, by this team and this player. Right now. Now your sports update with Alyssa Politi. After our New York News and Sports, MLB creates history with their first woman on field and full-time coach Alyssa Napkin. In her third season with the Giants, she substituted first base coach Antoine Richardson after his ejection from Tuesday night's contest against the San Diego Padres. Continuing, the Mets scored another win Tuesday night. However, Boomer and Geo's frustrations want Robinson Cano on the bench for good. On the brighter side, Yankees Anthony Volpe makes home debut with family by his side. Yankees John Carlos Stanton changed the StatCast era with an exit velocity of 116.2 miles per hour of the ball from his bat. On Tuesday, the Nets secured a first-round matchup with the Celtics in Brooklyn. Seems like history is being made in sports today. Stay tuned every half hour for more New York news and sports. In Westchester County, I'm Melissa Politi, WMCR 510 AM. One thing I should know about it, listen, technically this is an advanced, well, in actuality, it's an advanced course. But because of COVID, things, you know, if you haven't noticed, we're just kind of getting back into the groove of things. This was actually for Alyssa, what's equivalent to a Radio 1. And Alyssa did exceptional um, with this. It, maybe I shouldn't be that nice to her, but no, this, this really was um, one of several that were really quite good. Um, which brings me to another hat that I wear, which is video editing. Now, once again, video editing, um, it's really learning how to edit. And one of the questions that really has popped up in the last decade or so is, oh, what, what program are you using? At which point I, I kind of do this. <laughs> it's like saying, oh, I learned to drive. Oh, really? What kind of car do you drive? Well, OK. Does it matter if you drive a Corolla or you drive a, I don't know, I, I, I can't think of anything else, or a, 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 a Civic? No, a stop sign is still a stop sign. The gas is still on the, the right. Yeah. Um, the brake is the big, the big one. All right. Uh, it's the rules of the road. Now, with that said, you know, those of you again who know me know I wear many hats and I work outside of here. And one of the things I do is is edit, and I bring all that in that information, real world experience. I bring that all to you and. Um, from a practical standpoint also. So I am sort of platform agnostic I'm, as much as I can be. I used to be a strict Mac guy and now it's like I know more about Windows than I ever thought I would. Uh, it's just the nature of the beast. You can't get stuck and you have to keep going. But guess what? Regardless of whether it's Avid, DaVinci Resolve, Premiere, Final Cut, I'll be nice, 10. Uh, a little bit different. Regardless of what it is, an edit's an edit, a cut's a cut, a dissolve is a dissolve. When do you cut, when do you dissolve? They may do it differently, but it all, it all works in the end the same. So what I'm going to show you is one particular style of editing, which is sort of news magazine style of editing. The footage is quite old, but it's also quite real footage. So we're going to only play about uh, the first minute or so of it. And again, everybody cuts this. They have to follow a format. But the selection of the person they're interviewing or, or the interviewee is, is totally up to them. There's no particularly correct answer. And again, this is part of the editing process. Hello, I'm Kelvin Sawyer, and this is Eye on Broadcasting. During this segment, we'll be speaking with Bob Howard, president of NBC, Guy Mazio, vice president of Blair Syndication, and Deborah Blackwell, unit manager of the original Saturday Night Live. Stay tuned and hear about what goes on behind the scenes that reveal the inner workings of the television industry. Stay with us.
The cost to produce a television program has increased over the years. Bob Howard, former president of NBC, has an interesting story about how some of this money is spent. And one thing that stood out, delivery of tape or delivery of film, whichever it was from this one studio, which I would say to our Burbank studios was no more than, say, five miles away. And that's stretching it. And the cost of delivering that tape, now, you know what the size of a tape, you can put it in the back of uh, uh, a Volkswagen. That's the finished program. Delivered to the Burbank Studios, uh, came in at about $25,000. Coming up next, Vice President of Blair Syndication, Guy Mazio. and it was totally editorial decision. I give them a lot of leeway to be kind of creative. What were, um, well, they actually did something. This is one of the reasons I liked playing this as an example. Um, what possessed you to look for stock footage? Oh, stock footage. Well, we thought, you know, just listening to, to you know, just watching people talk would be kind of boring after a while, so we took, like, the, the photos to show, like, examples of what they were talking uh, just something entertaining to, to watch while they were talking about something that wasn't particularly interesting. Which is a good answer. <laughs> because one of the things they could not do, they were actually forbidden to do, was for us, the audience, to ever hear the interviewer. It had to stand on itself without hearing questions. So I think it really also helped to really help us find it people understand what they were talking about. So um, the other thing they did, which was a really nice touch, were, were the bumpers. Um, coming up next, Guy Mazio. That was really nice. Instead of just saying, we'll be back, we're just fading to black. So it was a really good job. Thank you. <laughs> So there also is an advanced level. I don't have any examples um, from the advanced level, but um, if level one, you learn what the rules are, level two, you learn how to break those rules. And you also get to be a little more creative in the fact that at least some of the projects you're actually creating, you're not working from stock footage. And there's, to, to, to uh, be a little reminiscent of Steve Jobs, there's one more thing. There's actually one more class that I teach, and I, I think I'm teaching it in the next semester. semester. Yeah, it's uh, basically, it's, I'll be very quickly quick with it. Um, it's called uh, uh, well, Media Technology. Technology. Understanding Media Technology. And the thing I personally like about the class is the technology turns over so much, it's never the same twice. And since I only do it every so many years, there are huge changes in technology. So one of the things, just as a little preview, um, if you ever, ever wonder how a computer network works, oh, you're going to learn. You're going to know what an IP address is and subnetting. Sounds like computer stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to this millennium. So um, you'll also learn stuff about how cameras work, microphones, all that stuff. And um, yeah. You'll learn some new cutting edge stuff. Once again, stuff that I deal with all the time. One of the things, I, I'm just gonna leave you with this. One of the things, I, I usually save this and, and make this statement at the, the Quill Awards, but um, yeah, some, something someone told me a long time ago, it's been true. You go to college to learn how to learn. Uh, because you know what? I thought it was you know, kind of a little bit of a hot shot when I graduated, and yeah, that, that, that dies off pretty quickly if you're not staying up to date. So, um, yeah, uh, we'll get you up to date. All right, that's it. Having a good time? I mean, you're learning a lot about the program, I hope. I bet you things you didn't really know that we did here in the program. And that's the whole point of the Media Studies Showcase. I mean, just to make students aware of what goes on in the showcase. 
Up next, we have Professor St Stephen DeRosa. Actually, he's putting on his professor's hat right now. Professor Stephen DeRosa teaches film studies in the film culture program. He also teaches screenwriting. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Stephen DeRosa. Thank you, Professor Grosso. Great to be finally back in person again. I know the last couple of years of the showcase, you were treated, I hope you were treated with uh, uh, an interview project, uh, a little mini documentary that my students have been making in uh, whatever course we happen to be working on that semester. Uh, so this semester of doing things a little bit differently. Uh, in the film and culture concentration, I think there's a misconception that we, we watch a lot of movies, we read a lot about movies, and we write a lot about movies. And yes, that happens, but I always try to bring in something a little different to apply like a practical application as to what, uh, what we're doing in the class and how you can apply that to the real world. Uh, and for the last uh, year and this coming year, I'm directing the International Film Festival for Mercy College. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to have students in my screen comedies and clowns class uh, actually form a little mock uh, screening uh, session or mock uh, film festival. And so for their final project and presentation project, we started early on in the semester to form a committee and then go through the process of uh, selecting a theme and deliberating on what titles and all the kinds of ins and outs. So uh, Victor Valley from uh, that course, he's a, a film and culture concentration major. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, this project. So welcome, Victor. So yeah, as um, Professor DeRosa said, um, we decided to do this kind of final as a, a mock screening. So we all decided on um, how comedy has, <coughs> has one side and within comedy also shows more of a deeper side of what it tries to represent in its own little way. <coughs> so you might be laughing with it, but it also explains more and goes in deep what you should feel about certain things about it. So our lineup was more filled with um, with comedies that are not really the types you would like first glance. You'd be like, oh, it's funny, but when you think about it, it goes more like, oh, this actually could mean something. So we have um, such differences like Jonah Rabbit, um, Robots Friday, Lars and the Red Girl, um, all the oh, thank you, the Truman Show, Man Called Ove, and um, White Chicks. So all these first glance, you see, oh, they're comedies. So they're just meant to make you laugh. But when you look more into it, they help you to feel something else within it. And when you have a deeper look into it, you could appreciate it more. So this is what we want to show with um, screen comedy. Right, so it, uh, each, uh, want to explain maybe how, so each uh, student, uh, after selecting a film and deliberating <coughs> with uh, the, the committee, they wrote their own blurb that also focuses not just on the, uh, like the synopsis or a teaser for the, the film itself, but also what issue or what, uh, what more serious side of the film uh, is being discussed. And then, if you want to click on one of those further reading, that's please, thank you. And then it's also about that selecting, so if this was a festival, and that, I heard something about a, a victory late night screening series, so this might be something we could tie in if we get funding from the uh, administration. All right, so, uh, there's going to be further reading. So if there's a discussion uh, post-film, usually uh, this, this would be something years ago up until uh, COVID, uh, I was bringing my classes to Alamo Draft House in Yonkers and working with the programmers. So this is, again, along the lines of, of, of something that students in this course are thinking about now. Uh, and there would be a, an introduction and then a post-screening discussion. So students are going to, uh, in, the, in this course, they're going to do an introduction for the movie. That will be their presentation. and. Uh, obviously the paper that you're writing, working on right now for, uh, for Friday, is, is Friday is about, um, that's going to be the sum and substance of your, your intro, but then you'd be prepared for um, answering Q&A and also showing the, like the back matter and, and so forth, of your work cited page and such, would be material that you're, you're pulling from. So, want to talk about Friday? Sure, uh, you go back. So, um, uh, Friday, it's, um, it's a 1995 comedy, includes Ice Cube and Chris Tucker, and um, it's essentially just a simple, like one day where um, you owe money to the local drug lord, you have to 
you know, survive the whole day, get enough money, you don't, you gotta survive a drive-by, you just, you gotta live, and it's typically, it seems to be just a Friday for that type of area, which is something, when you think about it, is a bit more interesting rather than just seeing on the flat surface of things. So, going into it, it's um, something to look for with um, representation, with how these types of areas are shown to the media. So you have people who are not from the area who look into it and they're like a bit off about it or sometimes think differently about it how it should be. So that's mainly what I want to show when I write about, write about Friday and show it in this um, showcase. Any questions? I also want to mention that this is uh, the first time I've had the opportunity to talk about it in person. Uh, but this is our Film and Culture WordPress site. This is a, a place to showcase student work. Uh, those documentaries that I mentioned earlier, those uh, live up here. Uh, Professor Crabb is with us as well, and he's been recommending like student work to be showcased. So that ends up in our uh, featured essays area. And something I started this, uh, this last semester in the spring, and, and we, we picked it up again uh, for this semester, is we're doing a blogathon. So rather than students just doing discussion uh, board posts on Blackboard, uh, I thought it would be cool to actually put it on a blog post where now it's available and open to the public. Students in the course then comment on each other's uh, blog posts individually, but it, then it's also open to share with your friends, to share with your classmates, schoolmates around the college. So this is up there. It's Mercy College, uh, filmandculture.com. So please visit the site. Uh, you'll see here by the scrolling board, we're also, uh, one more. The screenwriting competition, uh, Mercy uh, Communication of the Arts has a screenwriting competition every year. We're in our third year, and we're opening <coughs> entries now. And that segues nicely into talking about our screenwriting courses, uh, the screenwriting track, because there's actually two different courses. Uh, there's Media 258, which is uh, Fundamentals of Writing for Film and Television, and Media 359, which is Advanced. Uh, and Nathan Toro, uh, is, who was one of our winners of the competition last year, uh, is going to talk about the, the, the courses. Come on up, Nathan, please. Uh, and what we've done in the course, how uh, we workshop screenplays, how we take it from, uh, from initial concept and pitching several different concepts until the, the, uh, the project is greenlit, so to speak, so that you could go on to write and develop to get to a, a first draft. And what we're going to look at today also, uh, after Nathan talks about the course, is a scene reading. So we did a table read. Uh, a few weeks ago and recorded it. And we're going to look at one of the scenes uh, from, from Nathan's award-winning script. Take it away, Nathan, please. So you want me to speak about the, the, what the class is like? What the course is like, what's it, what it's like working the way we set it up like a writer's room. Uh, oh, that was definitely, um, it felt less like a class and more like a, like a really a group activity where we all just sat around in a table and we started throwing out ideas of different stories that we want to come up with and then he, helped us to figure out how to put it into a screenwriting format because it's a lot different than writing a novel or a screenplay, um, sorry, a, a playwright, a playwright, anything like that. Um, so we would meet every week and we would uh, follow what, um, I forgot who made it, the beat sheet? Oh, Blake Snyder's famous beat sheet. I think we get the name up here. Yes, Blake Snyder's beat sheet. That really helped a lot with uh, outlining our stories and really keeping the ball rolling because it's easy to just say, okay, this is my idea, now what? But that really helped a lot, and we were able to, at the end of the semester, have an entire screenplay, an entire TV like episode or movie to present and even submit for the screenwriting competition. I'm going to ask, do you remember what your log line was for uh, Life OS Update? Off the top of my head, I can't, because that was such a challenge. You're writing a log line is just 25, word, 25 words, right? About. So there are about 25 words, words or less. Um, and trying to com trying to compress an entire story into a, just a line like that, it was a. Uh, so he. So my character was experiencing cancer in a cyberpunk universe, but he couldn't afford chemotherapy. So the only way that he could overcome it was to become a cyborg. But in a universe the like the one that he lives in, they're not accepted. So. His entire. Uh, 
journey was becoming a cyborg and trying to not be discriminated so much in the universe. Should we play the clip? Yeah. You can play the clip. That's enough yeah. of a setup. <laughs> play the clip. <clears throat> Interior bunker night. BT-500 and Kenny are working together on an android's capitated body on a surgical table. Wires are sticking out of the android's neck, and its artificial vitals are being monitored on a hologram, similar to an EKG. Kenny types on his computer while BT-500 stares at the digital clock on the wall. Time? 2012. Will this be a painless process? Discomfort is possible. I won't know how painful this will be until then. The only time this has been performed was on an unconscious patient's head. What do you think will happen? Well, a psychological procedure will, like, like this, is highly unpredictable. You're forgetting this is experimental. BT-500 was concerned. His memories are going to be transferred into the AMF chip. Kenny holds up a pill-shaped object that is transparent with a circuit board interior. And the AI takes care of the rest. The programming in this... Android has, de has default commands on standby, correct? Correct. You know just as much as I do. I wouldn't recommend this if I feared failure. Do you have doubts? Kenny pauses for a moment and speaks with a hint of sadness. There's nothing to be concerned about. I just can't lose that. Tell him about the DNA match, BT. Why do I feel this way about him? Why not the other children I carried? I don't know. Will I ever know? The slam of a door is heard. The two turn and see Vaughn enter the room. Hey, did you guys find anything? Find what? I know you guys wouldn't take a no from me. Kenny and BT 500 make eye contact. Well, do you remember the android he was working on a while back? Which? Wait, the one with the head? I know it sounds risky, but we have solved what went wrong last time. I revisited genetic engineering and realized how harmful it is to a human host. However, a solution that will work for us is by transferring your consciousness. Vaughn looks stressed. <sighs> okay, so how is the surgery going to work? You will be transferring your personality, and memories into the android, essentially turning you into him. Silence. Vaughn's face is covered by his hands, and BT-500 stands there awkwardly. I know this isn't ideal, but it is our only option to keep you alive. No more cancer, no more pain. We don't have more time to spare. Vaughn is still silent. Please, Vaughn. Silence again. Vaughn and BT-500 share deep eye contact. All right. Guys, if this doesn't work, I don't want you to try and fight for me anymore. Another moment of silence. The room grows heavy with sentimentality. Okay. Cut to surgical room. Vaughn is prepped on the bed now. The surgical table has utensils ready. Beside Vaughn's bed is a large monitor and wires connecting Vaughn's body and Kenny's computer. Next to Vaughn, a foot away, is a lifeless naked android that is also connected to a monitor. Kenny and BT-500 are dressed in surgical scrubs and doing their best to not appear apprehensive. Okay, Vaughn. Do you need me to go over the procedure again? Yeah, please. I'm going to record your brain activity, which will be painless. Once that is completed, I will sedate you and continue the recording until I have enough data to store into the AMF chip I've created for you. Said chip will then be inserted into the Android body. How long will I be out? Six hours. Okay, sounds good. Now, you wish for your human body to be cremated, is that right? Yes, uh, yeah. I don't want to see it when I wake up. I'll make sure of that. There's a moment of silence as Kenny adjusts the machinery, and BT-500 stands by watching him. Am I going to... wake up? I don't know. 
Vaughn rubs his face with an expression of stress and fear. BT-500 rests a hand on his arm. They share a deep gaze as BT-500 strokes their finger on his skin. Are you okay? Vaughn scoffs but smiles. I don't know how to answer that, B. I feel the same. You'll be fine. Kenny's got you and I'll be back, hopefully. Don't say that. Don't say hopefully. You became so human, you know that? And you became more of a machine. Is that supposed to be a pun or something? No. You've lost yourself so much from this battle. I sometimes feel like I've lost you. Vaughn becomes silent and looks at Kenny. Kenny looks at BT-500 with an expression that is almost hard to read. He said, I'm not sure what to call it, but I will do my best for you. Vaughn seems emotional but holds himself together. I love you, B. I love you too. Later. Vaughn is sitting in the same bed, looking over a box of small trinkets and child's clothing. All of the items seem to have belonged to Vaughn growing up. He's looking at a tablet that displays photographs of himself, BT-500, and Kenny throughout their years of knowing each other and all of the projects they worked on. BT-500 looks at over them with him. They look happy. Giving you hair was the best thing we ever did. Why is that? I mean, look at you. Your head's so awkward without it. Your head is going to be just as awkward. Yeah, right. Look. Vaughn holds up the tablet, giving a side-by-side -side comparison of an old photo of BT-500 next to the lifeless android across from his bed. Kenny found me a pretty good-looking android. I chose it, actually. You did? BT-500 nod. You have good taste. I just paid attention to you. Do you think we'll function the same way? Like, I'll be... I'll be Able to remember the same amount of information as you? I suppose so. Cool. I remember wanting to be just like you. I guess little me would be pretty hyped to know this is happening. Is that so? Yeah. Yeah, I would. I guess like how every son wants to be like their parents or, or older sibling, you know, or something. Vaughn stares at the photographs on the screen while BT500 looks deep in thought. Well... BT-500 is cut off by Kenny Entry. <clears throat> okay, this is... This looks perfect. We're ready for phase two. Are you ready? Yeah. Vaughn puts the items away into the box while BT-500 helps. Next, Kenny and BT-500 prepare Vaughn for anesthesia. BT, push 10 milligrams into Vaughn's IV. BT-500 injects anesthesia into Vaughn's IV line. Hey, B? Yes? What were you going to say? What? Vaughn helps Vaughn to lay down now. Before Kenny walked in, I thought you were going to say something. Oh, no. I wasn't. Are you sure? Yes. Vaughn looks skeptical, but progressively looks tired. This... this stuff hits fast. Don't fight it, Vaughn. Okay. They watch him fall asleep and wait a moment. What were you going to say to him? I wanted to tell him about us. Ah, you can tell him when he wakes up. What if he doesn't? BT looks uncertain, then increasingly anxious. What if he dies not knowing I'm his surrogate mother? BT. I messed up. BT, cut it out. Now. He will not die, and he will know. He may still hear us as we're transferring his consciousness. Don't lose yourself now. BT 500 looks at Vaughn longingly for a moment. It then steps back and assists Kenny at the computer. Obviously, this is one of the screenplays, if not probably the most somber moment, uh, I think, in the screenplay. And throughout, there's uh, much more of uh, the series of adventures that BT, 500, and Vaughn get into. But uh, yet, I noticed, even in the somber tone here, you, you introduced humor yeah. uh, at different times. You want to talk about that at all? Um, so there was the, uh, typically, when I write my stories, there's always going to be the three characters. There's going to be the one that's very serious, the one that's very um, in between, and the one that's always like 
upbeat about everything going on. So that's definitely Vaughn in the situation, even though he's the one that's going through the most challenging uh, conflict, he still is going to introduce some some humor at times. Um, and that is exp inspired mostly from really myself. I didn't really um, <coughs> find too much inspiration in the universe except for uh, when I looked up things online like uh, cyberpunk universes, I would find things like uh, if anybody's ever heard of cyberpunk 2077 or if anyone's heard of uh, the trip become human, things like that I've looked into and I kind of plugged in my characters in a way that um, they can just morph around that universe in, in terms of uh, BT500 being an android, which um, typically is just, uh, they were never human at one point, and they are mostly the, how would you call it, um, they're the more realistic uh, person in this, or a realistic character, really, they're not human. Um, and then Penny was more of the, uh, how do you explain it, more of the, the, the supporting character to really help the two when they're in a rut. So they're going to approach things with the more wise, uh, knowing amount of information that the other two aren't really aware of. It's like the Greek chorus. Yeah. Okay. In terms of things like that. Um, and yeah, this scene was uh, pretty much towards the end of the script when uh, all hope was like pretty much almost at a loss because the amount of times that Kenny has tried to give Vaughn uh, amputations with cyborg, like cybernetic uh, amputations, um, or prosthetics. Parts. Prosthetics, yeah. Um, <coughs> this is when they had no choice but to just say, you know what, you're not going to be cyborg anymore. We're just going to straight up turn you into an android, and that was like a really risky thing because they didn't know if he was going to even still be the Vaughn that they knew, or if he was just going to be some sort of artificial intelligence version. Well done. Thank you. There's also a screenwriting club uh, that. Yes. <laughs> that means every Monday <laughs> semester thereabouts. Do you want to mention the screenwriting club? Yes. Um, every Monday is from writers. every Monday's from six to seven thirty. I host the screenwriting club uh, in Victory Two Hundred. It's a little bit hidden, but I'm sure everybody knows the Victory Hall by now. Um, if not, it's like right past the two glass doors where the media suite is, and we just meet up and we we brainstorm. We come up with a story, and we're actually in the process of finishing one right now. And we're going to need actors pretty soon to start filming the short film that we just created. I'm an audition. Come on by. <laughs> Any questions? And last but not least, we have a professor, Mark Palmieri, who teaches in the Com Studies program. He teaches our performance classes, theater courses, speech. He's a playwright. He's an author. He's a a performer, childhood screen performer, adult actor, you name it, he is it. <laughs> Please welcome Professor Mark Wait, Palmer. I was in something as a child? <laughs> I was in something as a child? You said you were you, I, I never said that, but if I was, give me the footage, because I'm owed money then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, thought you, I thought you were in the commercial. I thought you... Oh, I was 29, if that's a child. You had a baby face. <laughs> Show your age, Lou. You had a baby face. Yikes. It I wasn't that long about, ago. I didn't talk about his minor league baseball career. Oh, I sorry. I said that. I well, now about. we have to talk about that. No. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, thanks for um, um, uh, um, um, having me to do this. I, I do get to teach four uh, performance-centered courses uh, for, for media studies, cross-listed with the communications uh, program. Communication studies. Uh, the uh, the center of them are, is, is live performance, right? Uh, the approaches are a little bit different. The academic side of things vary a little bit. Whether we're discussing a sort of history, comprehensive history of, of the art form of theater, uh, if we're more into acting technique, voice and speech, uh, the the literature of, of playwriting and interpreting that into character building varies. I see some of some faces of folks that have been in in the in the different classes. And it just occurred to me, you know, like, uh, try to kind of say something summarily about, about all the things that we're dealing with here, right? And what is that? It's storytelling, right? We're all attracted to, uh, if we're here, and we're interested in any of these, uh, you know, angles on storytelling, that's, that's why we're here. And I would say beyond liking it and feeling like that you have some maybe natural uh, place to be in storytelling, we need it. This is how we make sense of our experiences, right? Um, the stories we tell ourselves, the stories that we communicate to others that, that, that help us make sense 
of our experience, which is, of course, the big challenge, right? Uh, experience is complicated. Our relationship with ourselves is always complicated and contradictory. There was a time where I'd be, if someone said, someday you'll get up in front of a college class and, and talk about storytelling and talking about, and have a, have a job at that, I would have said, you're crazy. Uh, that's not me. I'm not, I'm not good at this. I, I would never do this. Um, and it was because I got to discover uh, dramatic performance when I was an undergrad. I think I had to take it. I heard it was an easy A. It wasn't. Um, <laughs> but uh, I took a lot out of it. It changed me. And that's the most exciting thing for me, teaching the kinds of courses I get to do. Not only these four performance classes, but Oral Com. I know one of your all favorite courses, uh, Oral Com 110, where, where we, we, we learn things about ourselves that we may not have, have known uh, that not only are they in us just naturally, right, but that we, we might actually be good at them. And we can change. We can change by learning these aspects of ourselves. So that's what I love about performance training, right? There are, there are real uh, human, artistic, uh, confidence-building benefits to it, right? It's, it's something that we have to um, work for, prepare for, work with others for, de develop voice. We want to we wanna be seen. We want to be heard. We want to be understood. We want to be convincing in what we are doing. If you are all those things as a communicator in general, that's going to be a big help in life, right? So these, these courses, the mechanics that go into live performance, um, all involve that, getting better at it technically. And from the outside, when you get better at something from the outside, you suddenly feel that inside. And you start realizing you could do some, some things that you never really imagined doing, not being good at. And there's a lot of practical benefits for, benefits for that, right? Who has ever been the last to go in a class of where you had a presentation and you had to wait for your turn. Anyone ever been? Great, I just did it. I just did it for like, I don't know, two hours, however long we've been here. And I'm nervous. I got nervous, right? I'm, I'm worried that someone's going to be awesome before I, and they all were, so now I'm intimidated. I've got to follow Steve. That's rough. Edie has monologues in her video like I do and, and picked my exact color coordination, you know? And I'm just, I, I like, you know, I'm like, I'm gonna flop, you know? This is, I'm gonna bore everybody and they wanna go, it's hot, they already ate. And, and so what got me through that? Well, I knew, I knew I could act. I knew I could act, I could fake it. I could get up here and play this part. I'm playing a pro professor right now. Okay, how am I doing, Nick? <laughs> Nick, thanks, thanks. Um, uh, I know some folks that, that, have, that have gone through this process. Uh, and that's real valuable to know you can do that in life. When you're nervous and you have to go do something really important, an interview, a presentation, you have to tell your kid and their friends, no, you're not going to go to that party, right? And they're all going to come at you and you want to let them go, but you've got to act tough. That's really important to be able to act. It's something that is in all of us. It's very human. When we're little, all of us here, I'm going to bet, we're playing when you were really little. You were telling stories to yourself. Even before you had full language, you were probably telling stories to each other to make sense of what's going on, right, in your life. Even you have no, no other way to express it. So you pick up dolls and make them play, and you listen, and you're convinced it's real in a certain sense because it's based on your experience. There's something we need from all of this, right? There's something we need from storytelling. I get to represent the oldest, the oldest form of storytelling if we discount maybe the paintings on the cave walls, all right? But... Uh, in, in terms of verbal storytelling, performance, theater was first, right? Uh, probably started as, the, 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 you know, the legend is there was a, a hunter, gatherer, crew, went out for a hunt. They came back around the fire that night, and someone, in whatever language or gesture, said, how'd you get this awesome, I don't know, dinosaur to eat, or whatever it was, right? And someone got up. And started, probably exaggerated the whole thing. Who knows if that person was even there for the hunt, right? But got up and told the whole story of the hunt. And everyone was listening. And, 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 and that person said, that was awesome. Next time I might you know, embellish a little bit, you know, make something else, bring in a prop or two, whatever. And there we have it, right? We have the tradition of oral storytelling or performance. That person was seen, heard, very convincing, no doubt, right? And this is what we try to achieve in all of these four performance courses. Technically, what are the benefits? I just named some, you know, that your ability that you know, even if you're not feeling like you can, that you know you've done it. That you've, you've, you've done something you maybe wouldn't have expected to do in your college experience. You assumed a character, you memorized, you prepared, and you executed a performance in front of other people. Something that you may not think that you would do well, right? And then you find out you did well. As I see a bunch of faces here that I've seen that do really well, and some of them have been hired professionally to do some work. That check clear, by the way, Jenny? It wasn't for me, but oh, it was unpaid. 
Oh, great. Sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, I know some of this is great. Really. I'm oh, sorry about that. Great. It was an honor right. to be part of it. All right. It was paid in spiritual benefits. Yeah. I see. Okay, great. Um, so, so I really encourage it. I think it's a great thing to, to add to your liberal arts college experience, something that you might not do. And here's the other thing. Um, it's not about sending people off their career track and into a pursuit of acting. I would never do that. I wouldn't want to be running from your parents or across campus uh, for destroying your lives. Um, but I will tell you that in, in your communities, this is available to you. It's everywhere. Theater, local community theater, uh, that form of storytelling is everywhere. And it's like my, my dream that you would develop maybe a new appreciation for this, right? This, this, this a, a, a little more challenging art form than sitting back and watching Netflix, right? You go somewhere, you're with other people, um, it, they, they, they tend to be, you know, uh, less, less flashy, less edited, all those, the important things that you just heard that are, are of course, so key in uh, these other technologies and these other forms, but they require, a, a, you know, a, a different kind of attention span to watch live theater. It, it, it's different, and it, it's, it's something that's really important also to be able to do that, to be able to know how to read a play, how to listen to a play. This is some of our oldest, most important, sacred literature was written in this form. Um, so each of the courses come down to two performance projects, as you well know. You just finished one, Christy. Um, you're going to see yourself in this video. Uh, we used to, a few times we had this on a Wednesday right in the room there in the, in the lecture hall where we do this, a proper proscenium theater. And we, uh, sometimes I bring a whole cast in, switch the lights, and it's a whole scary Phantom of the Opera showcase for, for media studies. Today, uh, I just have a video of some monologue projects. Another thing that Edie grabbed um, before I knew, uh, you, have, you have acting on your, on your film. So I, we also have monologues, same kind of thing. Um, we, 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 we start from looking at a script, we develop characters, we work on technical exercises of movement and voice and listening, interpreting the story within, and then they're performed live on stage with nice big voices that fill the room, uh, which takes work, right? All of, this, all of this work, of course, not only goes to making you a better performer, but making you a better presenter, a stronger presence wherever you are. And I'll tell you, it, 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 it can take a long time in life to assume that space, to fill up that space as a charismatic performer. It's, it's, there are things you can learn to get better at it, okay? So if you're not comfortable with yourself, uh, in, in, in space, in front of people, when you're listening to, that could be a social thing, it could be a relationships thing, this is the kind of training that can help, really. And a lot of these courses offer that. So um, in, in elements of theater, play production, scene performance, uh, intro to acting, of course, uh, it comes down to two primary proje uh, projects. The monologue, where someone is working on all of these things with creating a character and then delivering a, a, you know, a speech from a moment of a bigger story. And then we have scene work, where we are paired up or tripled up, and people are working with each other to deliver an effective performance of whatever the playwright pre-scripted and blueprinted for that. So you're going to see just, uh, you know, since COVID, we, uh, I, I have added the aspect of bringing, once we do our live performances, to put them on videotape, to maybe go out and on location and, and get these speeches so that you could have something afterwards, you know, that you, that you accomplish and you see what your, what your work looks like. Because um, it's the one thing about live performance, you can't really watch yourself, you know, that's, um, so in this, in this sense, it's a nice uh, takeaway that we have it on, on video. So um, the first round, uh, it says it's from Elements of Theater. It's act, uh, actually swapped. It's, it's a scene production, a scene performance, excuse me, and play production. Elements of Theater is the scene. A word about that. You're going to see two, uh, two gentlemen go at it on stage. Uh, by go at it, I mean with harsh dialogue. And uh, there's some curse words in it. So I'm sorry about that. I know that's probably not something you're used to encountering. Uh, on film and TV. So you're going to see some F words uh, to send us all home today. Sorry, Lou. Um, but uh, so we have, we have the monologue project first. It's sort of a sizzle reel. They're not complete. They're just sort of a sampling of, 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 of each other's work kind of jammed together. And then the scene's going to go right into that. Um, we have uh, uh, a theater club. I just want to say this last thing. Nick's uh, representative here of also the theater club. Yes? Yeah. Which has, what, what are we, 20, 30 members? I mean, there's like tons of people now, right? I don't even know. 
It's unmanaged. It's so, it's so popular you can't get in. Now, you know, uh, but you can get in. Everyone gets in, and everyone who, who wants to be part of it can be part of it. And it's a really growing, wonderful thing to do. And the cool thing is we have people from all over, all different majors, right? All different pursuits. Um, and what unifies the whole, you know, one of the purposes is that wherever you're from, there's theater in your community. There's something you could do with this. Uh, and you don't have to, um, you know, necessarily be an aspirant to the profession. Um, which is something that really means a lot to me. I kind of like community theater more than any other theater. That's not because only my, my plays are only produced there. Um, okay, so <laughs> let's, uh, let's, uh, let's hear it. I see. Now that you explained yourself, it makes sense. Why do guys have to play these stupid games? I feel good. I feel good out with you guys again. I understand it's been hard for you. I get that. But you forget that I am a person. So as long as we're on the same page, then we're gonna be all right. I mean, if you like me and you're thinking me, pick up your stupid phone, right? You must let the last man go. It's honorable. He's the last peanut to make it out of the bag. He's the last warrior. The last samurai. You're just one more pretentious asshole. You know, I had enough of guys like you. You supposedly sad guys who don't believe in monogamy anymore. Waiting is stupid, and it could really bite the guy in the ass because by the time he does call, maybe a guy with bigger balls calls first. Do you know why it feels so right? Because you guys are real. You have a sense of humor. You live your lives. I mean, we were driving out here. I told George, the driver, to roll the windows down just so I could smell the air. The smell of freshly cut grass. Great. Oh shit, it's him. Oh my god, should I pick up? Should I answer? Should I pick up? I should have asked her to come over or at least asked her if anything was wrong, but... She seemed normal. So, it makes it hard for me to tell you this. I wish we were closer. I wish we were friends. But at least we gotta coexist. Does it look bad if I call back if he doesn't leave a message? Or does it like look bad if I call back right away? If I call back right away, it'll look like I frantically dope for my phone just missing the last ring and called right back. I'm so tired of guys like you. You sarcastic guys who spend all your time pointing out the shortcomings of others, rolling their eyes, shaking their heads, passing judgment and cracking jokes. You're not unique. Doesn't matter what color the m, &M is. It could be green, red, yellow, purple. So here's my terms. I accept your offer. I accept the salary. I'll be here 9 a.m. Monday morning and you you go into VP's office, Mr. John Samuel Burton, and you tell him to pack his bags. That's my ex-husband. I'm not, you know, some worker you've hired to cook and clean. I am your roommate. But there's something wrong with this way of life. People look at me like I'm going to do something. I'm afraid, really. I don't belong here. Ugh, forget it. Treat me nice before I have an outburst. A real outburst. I'm talking a sumo wrestler level outburst. Bigger than any of your outbursts. Bigger than 10 of yours. <sighs> so no more outbursts, please. I keep wondering if there was something in the movie, something I said, something she said, some trigger or, or some reason. I just keep trying to look for clues. You know, I gotta tell you the truth. You fucked up. And now you're gonna live with it. I gotta wait. At least a few minutes. Or tomorrow. Waiting is smart. <laughs> Don't 
don't call me nuts. You know, I hate that. Why are you so stupid, Frank? Because I love Tell her. Tell me why. No, because I love her, okay? Love makes you do stupid things. You love her? You stupid yes. bastard. Yes, yes, I do. I love her. Listen, Frank, you can't. Don't, Sal, this is, this is what I told you what I want for me. Look at me, Frank. See my face now. Frank, look. You have a family now. Come on. Sal, a family. Yeah, a family that I never wanted. A, a woman that I was pressured into, a woman that I never even loved. Look, Salve, you can't tell me what to do anymore. What, because you think that dad's dead, you're my fucking boss now? Yeah. Is that what it is? I am your boss. When dad died, Frank, he passed everything on to me. And it's my burden to make sure this family moves forward and to see things are done right. And that, makes, that means making sure my brother doesn't mess up his life. Listen, Frank, you have a choice. Look, we're on to something right now. But I need you to have a clear mind. Frank, I'm sending you upstate to get fixed. And when you come back, listen, you'll resume your life better than it was before. Frank, this stops today. Okay. Okay. Okay, so wait, 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 Sal. So, like, what, what am I supposed to tell you then, huh? Frank. Tell her her brother is dead. What? Wait, Sal. Um. <laughs> Sorry, I think. So you're not telling the truth. I I know you. I, I you're bad, but you're not murder bad. Sal. Sal, look at me. Please tell me you're telling, you're not telling the truth. Listen, Frank, that money that you gave him was not our money. That money was the Gufelchis. You understand? And listen, I'm glad you paid off your debt, but that was wrong of you to do that. And if you weren't my brother, you'd be buried in a hole, somewhere in the woods right now. Oh God. Listen to me, Frank. Wait, wait, sorry, Sal. So what, you, you, you knew it was for the Gufachis and you didn't tell me? Yes, Frank. I have my reasons why, okay? Fuck. I'm sorry. Fuck, I'm so sorry. Don't be sorry to me. Frank, be sorry to yourself. I'm, I'm not sorry to you. <laughs> well, I saved your life. You, you saved my life. You destroyed my life by bringing me into this disgusting business. Frank, Frank, our family business. Our fucking family's disgusting business. And look, Sal, I was wrong for it, okay? I always was. But for some reason, you just couldn't live with me being free my, to be myself. What, you want me to be, you want me to be sorry to you? Is that what this is? Sal, I fucking hate you. And you know what? You better find a way to kill me too before I find a way to put you in the ground like the rest of them. Frank, listen, you're going away for a bit. You'll calm down and you'll see clearly. Listen, Frank, Frank, you're just emotional right now. That's all it is. Yeah, must be it. I love that woman self and nothing's gonna stop us. <laughs> yeah, you know what, Frank? I'll stop you. You know I will. I always have. Starts from just a little script. They read it to each other. They start, you know, doing the different work, blocking, physically making it work, working on their acting technique, creating who they are. Wonderful process. Um, and we put it on video just like that because I knew where to stand with the camera because they mapped all that out. All that movement was, was, uh, was chosen, was marked, and rehearsed and rehearsed. It's a really fun process. So uh, very lucky I get to teach very fun stuff. And I'd like to have you uh, in one of these, at least one of these performance courses along your way. Uh, introduction to acting is next semester. We're, uh, we're so full, we're over tallying. Thank you very much. Um, but I love that they all come down to the same two projects, the same, the same you know, focus, which is what you just saw right there. So, uh, thanks.
how you know I put you last, because to follow you is trouble. <laughs> oh, no, that's not true. Thank you. I want to thank you all for attending. Uh, it's great that we could do this in person again. Like I said, the last two years are brutal. But now we could show the work in person. We could come together. And when you, when you show the work in person, you get a chance to see your work on the screen and watch other people's reaction to it. That really tells whether it's good or not. That's, you know, it's important to do that. I mean, online is good. You put it online, you upload it, and you don't know what people really think of it. But when you're in the room and people laugh at your jokes or people ooh and ah about a particular scene that you had written, then you see the impact. So being in person is really very important. I'm so very glad. I thank you all for attending. To Dr. West for attending. Dr. Hernandez, she just left the Provo. She just left. I'm going to thank her. I'm going to thank Eduardo for running AV. Jay Liz Picardo for helping out with scheduling with the food and, and everything else. And uh, the faculty was just wonderful. I'm just, uh, I'm just. Thank you, Lou. Thank we you have a room for another hour of your lunch. Take a sandwich on the way out. That's that's your that's your food.